We're talking about the scripture giving us the admonition, admonition to beware of Satan's strategy. If you take a look at the things that are happening in people's lives, and I, and I hear Dorothy consistently saying that the Lord had told her things are going to get worse and we need to pray, which is so true in its, uh, in its essence. But why will things get worse and why do we need to pray more? Because Satan is becoming more and more influential in the lives of people, whether saved or unsaved. We have no concept of the ability of his influence, of what he can do in the lives of unsuspecting people. But I'll give you a, just an in increment of what his ability is. Turn on to Re Revelation, the 20th chapter. Revelation, the 20th chapter, what it takes to immunize the human race from his influence. This, of course, will take place at the end of the tribulation period. But man will see the effect of his influence and the potency of what it can do to the whole creation. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. So this is what it takes to insulate, isolate the human race from his influence, binding him, putting him in the bottom of the bottomless pit, and then putting a seal around him that would seal up his influence from emanating outward to the human race. His influence is so potent because of the things that he has done to the human mind which the scripture tells us in Romans the 8th chapter, has rendered the human mind totally corrupt. So that God does not operate through the mind. He operates through the new creation spirit that he puts within man. Why? Because the mind is totally corrupted by the satanic influence. Having said that, God has a restrainer upon him so that his influence cannot reach its full capacity until the, the Lord, until the Father's plan for his people has reached its culmination. In other words, when the saints who are looking for the coming of the Lord and prepared for the coming of the Lord are taken off the earth, then the power of evil, the power of satanic influence will wax to its fullness. And the human race will experience it in its fullness. Having said that, God is allowing his influence to increase in the lives of men to a greater and greater degree. And the mind of man cannot withstand the influence of Satan. Case in point, even with the disciples who walked with Jesus and saw the power of Jesus and we're under protection to a great degree of the influence of Jesus. Jesus looked, turned to Peter and said, Peter, Satan desires to have you that he might sift you as wheat. The power of satanic influence is not to be underestimated. The only thing that can defeat it is the power of God operating in the life of the saint. Darlene here was talking about her children being lax 
in their commitment to the Lord. We cannot afford that. I guarantee you it's a recipe for disaster because the satanic influence, unchecked, is going to come into the life of an individual and they're going to experience it to a greater and greater degree if they're not protected from it. God has given us protection. The pastor was talking about Job and how God had a hedge around Job. And we all have hedges of protection. But those hedges of protection are only effective as you live a committed Christian life. As you realize that God in the person of Jesus Christ is number one in your life and you actively about the master's business. In your hedge is in full protection. Other than that, anything less than that is an open door for satanic influence. And we're seeing the things that are happening now. Turn to Isaiah, the 14th chapter. You want verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. And the prophet looking into the future, seeing the ultimate demise of Lucifer. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Which did weaken the nations? The word weaken there in Hebrew literally means to waste away. What does he mean? He's talking about the activity of Satan upon the human race. The actions of weakening, draining, by attrition, taking the strength away from man and to the point where man comes under the influence and ultimate control of Satan. He's doing this now. He's being allowed to weaken the nations. And when they're at that point, he's going to manipulate them. He's going to gather them together as a whole. And what is he going to do once that takes place? He's going to use everybody on the face of the earth against Christians. Jesus said, the time will come when you'll be hated of all men for my name's sake. It'll be a time when we can't possibly imagine what Christians who are left behind are going to go through under the satanic influence. They're going to be hunted down, persecuted, tortured, and ultimately killed. Turn to the book of Daniel, 7th chapter. Daniel 7, verse 25. During the tribulation period, this is going to continue. Satan is going to continue to weaken the nation. Here, the activity of the Antichrist, supernaturally empowered by Satan. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. They think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. The word wear out there literally means mentally. They're going to drain the mental resolve of the saints. And this is happening now. He's trying to wear out the saints of God. How does that happen? Through attrition. He comes into the mind, plants thoughts in the mind, brings conditions into the life of the saints in which because of a lack of a lack of <clears throat> putting God's word into operation in the life, the individual tries to combat the problems and the conditions in his own strength. 
can't do it, can't be done. Depression, stress, all the things that eat away at the mental resolve are under attack through this wearing out process of Satan. And the saint ultimately reaches a point where he is no longer willing to fight, no longer willing, actually is resolved, is just totally taken down by this attrition of the enemy. You cannot fight a spiritual battle physically. Ignorance of God's word, ignorance of the principles of God will leave that person wide open to the influences of Satan and the attacks of Satan. He is warring against the saints, has been doing so consistently, continually. He does not sleep, does not slumber 24-7. Turn to 1 Peter 5th chapter, verse 8. 1 Peter 5th chapter, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's consistently looking for opportunities to influence the life of God's people and to wear them down mentally, emotionally. He'll bring things into the life, conditions that are programmed, that are that are crafted to cause anxiety, to cause depression, to cause negative results. We are operating in a spiritual warfare, whether we believe it or not, whether we know it or not, the scripture is telling us plainly, if you don't fight, you're gonna go into bondage, as simple as that, to something. Now what is the antidote to Satan's attacks? Turn to 2 Corinthians, first chapter, verse 8 to 9. Paul illustrates this because he underwent heavy attacks of Satan. 2 Corinthians, first chapter. Verses 8 to 9. For well, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. See, uh, uh, but Paul came under a satanic attack that literally brought him down to a point of despair. And he realized why it was happening and why he was allowing it. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. The word sentence there is answer, antidote. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Paul was trying to do all this in his own strength. And it was draining him. He was weakening. He was being worn out. And then the Holy Spirit quickened him in his depths of depression. All oh, you're trying to do it in your own strength. Depend on me. And Paul realized, what am I doing? And that's exactly what he did. Turn to Philippians, third chapter. Excuse me. Philippians, fourth chapter. Philippians 4th chapter, verses 11 to 13. We read these scriptures in our Sunday school class.
Philippians 4, verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want or need. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not belly aching about what I need, what I have to have. Why? He says, for I've learned to be, whatsoever state I am therewith, to be content. Paul has learned a lesson that many Christians don't learn. And that is, whatever situation you're in, relax. Know that God is there, God is with you. And God is well able to take care of the situation. That's the first stage in depending upon God and not ourselves. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul is saying, in Christ I can deal with all circumstances, all situations. I don't stress on anything. And understand Paul is writing this from a jail cell. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Prime principle of God's word. The battle belongs to the Lord. We don't walk in our own strength. We walk in his strength. We learn to depend upon him in all situations. Whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever it is you're facing, bring God into the equation immediately. Put your focus on God, not on the situation. And God will give us the understanding of how to face this situation. He'll give us the true picture of the situation. The mind of man is not capable of seeing things as they are. The mind of man only sees things as they appear to be. This big mountain that's such an obstacle I can never get through it over and around it. Well, if we, if we allow God to come into the equation, he will give us a true view of that mountain and we find it's just a molehill in comparison to where God sees it. And right away, the circumstance, God will begin to change the circumstance as we invite him into the circumstance. That's the key to victory. The victory comes with Jesus, not ourselves. The enemy is depending upon us to do it in our own strength, from our own logical thinking. And of course, that only allows him to make it worse and worse and worse and become more and more ensnared in this thing. When we do it God's way, the first thing that you will feel, once you relax, depend upon God, you begin to feel a joy, a confidence, a peace. And the enemy begins to lose. He loses his grip. He loses his ability to wear you down. Everything changes when God comes into the equation. Everything changes when God comes into the equation. And then, the prime focus should be, turn to Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3, we close him with this. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. When you see people stressing, when you see people going under, it's because they have not applied God's word to their situation, to their life. Either they're ignorant of it or they don't believe it. When we take God's word, God's principles, God says, I'm with you. Always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And we just relax in Christ. Allow his peace, his love, and his joy to overwhelm us, over, overflow our lives. The ability of the enemy to wear us down ceases. 
God fills all things. And then the capstone is begin to praise him. Begin out of your heart to praise him. Even though nothing's changed, but your understanding of his potential, potent, potential to change it, his potential capabilities, his greatness, begin to praise him for who he is. And immediately, the change will drop. Immediately, you become free. Immediately, God begins to move in your behalf. It's a win-win situation. We walk free. The enemy is defeated. God gets the glory. And we go onward to bigger and better things in Christ. Beware of Satan's strategies. God's given us the ability to counter every one of them and turn them back on him and walk free in peace, joy, and love. God bless.